Mother. Man. Hey, if Johnny Z was here, he'd tell you you better listen to Murder Metal Mayhem, motherfucker. Spreading faster than a case of the clap in a trailer court. Able to shatter eardrums within a 666 mile radius. A podcast more brutal than all the rest. It's Murder Metal Johnny Z action there. Hell yeah, what the fuck? Hell yeah, Tuesday guys, we're throwing down a new Murder Metal Mayhem in the Horns High Studios for the Horns High Podcast Network, though Chris, we're doing a bonus tonight. A little short episode. A little short episode on one single topic, and uh, of course I got Chris, Joey, I got Michael Shaw back in here, he's not mic'd up, no pun intended, but he is, <laughs> Mike is here, just not mic'd up, Okay. So how's it going, everybody? Not Back bad. Good. What's Doing up? all right. What's up? Doing, Doing all right. Everybody have a good Fourth of July. It's actually pretty, pretty fucking decent last night. Hell yeah, dude! Like, yeah, yeah it was your your get together was last night, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I know people did them on Sunday. You know, depending on. Yeah, we, where their fireworks were or what they were doing. You yeah, know? we just had people over at the new house, and it's close enough there to Miller Park. We were able to see the fucking fireworks pretty easy. Climbed up on the roof of the garage and the house and oh, shit. Oh, perfect, like, perfect. It was cool fucking. Yeah, that's awesome. Good time. That's awesome. Weather was pretty decent. A little warmer yesterday, but holy shit, Dude. it's fucking hot today. Over 100 degrees. Dude, there was that big ass. humid as fuck. We man. missed that big ass storm that went right fucking above, right north above us, dude. Yeah. Like huge fucking storm. Right. I didn't know nothing about it. My parents were like, oh yeah, we haven't had power for like six hours. It just came back on. Oh my They're God. In February. I was like. Oh wow. I was yeah. like, we didn't get nothing. I didn't know nothing about it. Was that the last Michael night? Was talking. Yeah. Yeah, it was yesterday, yesterday. afternoon. Oh, interesting. Early evening, okay. something like that. Yeah interesting wow well i'm glad we did not get that so all right what shirts we got on tonight chris what you going on with? uh it's the old school fucking basic black with uh white malignancy lettering they just logo malignancy fucking old school shit old school for sure that's cool yeah, you, if you can't tell i've had this shirt for a, yeah for i was minute. gonna say you've <laughs> definitely worn that shirt and that's awesome that's what makes them great i love having shirts like that they're just comfortable man worn oh, yeah, it so dude. many fucking times Joey, I see you got something representing your new uh, domain over there. Yeah, and you were talking about comfort, and that's all I was going for today because it's fucking hot as balls. Literally 100 degrees out. So I got the old 419 shirt, uh, repping that Punky Brooks for, for all the listeners. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I got this shirt today yeah. right before you guys got here. It's dope. Um, the uh, Mayhem shirt. Um, it's fucking just killer man wait that shirt no it's not mayhem it's gruesome oh I'm sorry. i was like hey hold on <laughs> i was looking at something that said mayhem i got confused for a second i'm like hold on sorry. a second that murder is not metal gruesome like... murder metal gruesome no but i i ordered this from relapse on Bandcamp, and uh they didn't tell me it was on the way so i was surprised which yeah. is kind of cool and uh so i got it today and Fucking so right. been listening to gruesome played some last week and probably been Playing some more. I downloaded a couple of their albums. Fuck and yeah. I really like using Bandcamp for that. I know it helps the bands out, so that that's a good thing. All right, very cool. Well, we're going to be doing another round of fake commercials tonight. So that's that should be good. Fun sitting here to throw down a voice. Yeah, What's Michael's you? here because he knows when we do the commercials, it's a good time. And uh, we always have fun doing those. So that'll be good. And I'm sure we'll get Michael in some embarrassing fucking situation tonight. <laughs> so. Makes it fun. And we've been using him, Joey, in the killer cage matches. I mean, he's really been. We're putting it out there, yeah. you know. So he's he's very very famous. On he, here. Out here. <laughs> he, he out here. He out here. And you know he's got a name that starts with M, so he might be campaigning for like Murder Metal Michael, oh, or man. something like that. You know, I don't know. That's better than top fan status. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rename the podcast. All right. Well, last week, guys, we did another prison episode. Those are always fun. Oh yeah. Chris, we get our homeboy down there in fucking Texas. Tex, fucking getting on here with us after a long manhunt. Yeah, that was interesting to hear his take on some things, and especially the Huntsville prison siege. 
an 11 day hostage standoff in 1974. Definitely a good story. And unfortunately ended in four, well, two deaths, two were, uh, did everybody a favor, but the other two were innocent people. And, uh, just a fucking very crazy thing, Chris. The the fucking taco that was just <laughs> that was just too Trojan funny. taco. Yeah, so just hilarious. <laughs> I got, I mean, stuff. They put a lot of effort into fucking they doing did, that man. shit. Though, I mean, so that's some DIY Props shit like a that. motherfucker, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I mean, why use Kevlar when you've got law books? You got law books, you know, exactly. and some duct tape. <laughs> so red green that shit, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so uh, we also had a good metal segment, Joey, because you had the horns last week. Yeah, I got to uh, do one on our buddy from here, fucking Necro Cannibal Ass Grinder. Hell yeah. Uh, got around, we, we did the interview too, which we posted the, the day after on yeah. Friday. And it got like 600 listens or something. Yeah, it did really well fucking, so far. Thank you for everybody that listened to that. That's fucking yeah, cool. That's fucking sick. Yeah, and hopefully turning some people on to Gummo and yeah. his Necro Cannibal Ass Grinder stuff. So good <laughs> shit, man. Definitely for... Especially a, a guy that supports the podcast. Oh, He's yeah. been with us for the beginning. Yeah, so. for sure. So we appreciate it, Gummo, and uh, glad you're a listener and a necro cannibal ass grinder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got a double dose of that last week. So much more insanity on that one. Two hours and 29 minutes of just craziness. Just us being us. <laughs> us being us is a good way to put it. We were just passing 900 to that one today, which is great. Nice. Uh, so thank you, those that have listened. And Joey, you mentioned just passing 500 on 183 yeah. uh, or the bonus episode of the uh, full interview with Gummo. So Fuck yeah. Very, very good stuff, and we appreciate it, guys. Tonight, we are doing a bonus episode, and as Chris mentioned, that means it's not the usual murder, metal, mayhem format. So if you're a new listener and just happen to stumble on this one, this is not a typical. But we like to do these from time to time on just a single topic chris we had like so many good feedback sometimes yeah from the last one yeah uh that we did on dugout dick yeah huge dude, response to dugout that. dig yeah i so. mean the dude was that that dude knew how to live fucking life the way he fucking wanted to and didn't let nobody stop and so. speaking of dugout dick remember we talked about mick our australian police officer yep. a yeah. listener he said that it reminded him of a story, Alvis, the, the spoon spoons. man, yeah, yeah, spoons. the spoon, that fucking song spoon man. That's about that dude. That is some crazy shit. Oh, like the Soundgarden song is yes. about that dude? He plays, it's a real guy, right, but right. he plays these fucking spoons and it's like, dude, it's insane how he makes them sound I've on his face. I've seen motherfuckers play spoons that are like, holy shit. Yeah. Dude. yeah, bro. We've all seen the Soundgarden video. We get it. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah, go, go <laughs> to... No, that dude's uh, sick for real. Right, right. Go, go to YouTube and type artist, A-R-T-I-S, the spoon or the spoon man. And yeah, you'll thank me. It's fucking cool. There's so many videos of him like on the street doing it yeah. in a studio on stage. I mean, it's it's an impressive fucking deal. Right. So I would love to do an episode on that guy. So this is like that. Although this one is about metal. So we're doing something, you know, on a, on a topic that has to do with the uh, heavy metal. The metal segment. Which is, you know, how we would know CK would love this. You know, CK... Would have definitely enjoyed doing this one. And coming after a holiday weekend Fuck yeah. gives us a little break. And these are a lot easier to put together. So uh, so we hope you guys dig it. So tonight we're talking about a true legend in the world of metal. Definitely thrash metal for sure. John Zazula, also known as Johnny Z. He and his wife Marsha were huge influences in metal going all the way back to the early 80s with Megaforce Records, which was one of the early, you know, Metal Blade and Megaforce and Combat were like the three that were right. putting out the underground stuff at the time, which was considered very, you know, different than the mainstream stuff like Sabbath and Ozzy and Dio and Maiden, which, you right. know, having grown up in this time period, listening to metal, I could definitely say that it was like a noticeable shift of like, wow, all of a sudden I can buy this stuff I've been reading about right, yeah. in magazines. I can actually you know? find it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, there's a store that sells this. Of course, talking long before the internet. But when we're talking some household names here that he found, 
Metallica, of course, is the one everybody mentions because right. they're the biggest one. And it's a cool story of how they stumbled on uh, Metallica. Anthrax, uh, how Scott Ian like drove him nuts to get him to listen to him and kind of went through some love hate there. And then eventually, you know, they were the ones that got uh, Anthrax signed to the major label because he ran uh, his management business as well, uh, in addition to Megaforce. Merciful Fate, Overkill, King's X, Testament. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And so we're going to talk a little bit about his story and uh, a book that I recently read that he wrote, uh, which is very, very cool. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll tell you about that so you can get your own copy. I got mine on eBay, I think, or on Amazon, but uh, we'll talk about that. So. All right, we got a new addition to the studio, guys. We got oh, a yeah. brand new mask, Joey. Fucking Jim Jones up there. Fuck yeah, Jim sick Rick. How does it look in the in the stand? Does oh, it, it looks awesome. Yeah, it looks. Yeah, it's. Does like, it need to be like raised, or is it about even it's with Dama? Even. All right, yeah, I think cool. it's pretty even. Yeah. Yeah, we've got quite the uh, quite the collection in here, but Joey, that's our Jim Jones mask from Sick, sick Rick. Rick. We talk about Sick Rick. Sick Rick has has been uh, cool enough to sponsor the podcast for the next three months. That's fucking awesome. But we're going to be talking about Rick. We're going to be doing an interview with him coming up. Hell yeah. And how you can get some of these incredible masks. Chris, that's number nine. I know. That's fucking crazy. We've got a lot of them in here. We're going to take some pictures tonight. I'd like to take a picture of all the masks uh, as they sit, Rick said, is there a way you could get them all in one shot? And I'm like, we can do it. We could, but we'd have to get far enough back and you wouldn't really see them. So I'm thinking, well, not like that, but we can, we can take these ones and the Dominus off their stands, uh, hold them up over here. Yeah. We'll get a picture with all of them together. Uh, I was going to say we're a panoramic. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That's cool too. Yeah. That, that might be a way too. My yeah. I wanted them kind that. of My in where they are here. There's a significance. Right. Of, right. Of Dominus I posted being over a there. picture of the five over here, so people are probably seeing that right now. That's cool. But yeah, to get but all. Yeah, he's doing serial killers. He's oh, done, yeah. you know, music he's like Gigi El Duce, Allen, Gigi Allen, uh, David Bowie. Um, he's done some really cool stuff. So Rick is amazing. He so did those sick, ones Rick. With, uh, the Charles Manson with the Manson ashes. Uh uh-uh. uh Right. Fuck. Didn't he have some that he fucking? I don't know. I know he did Manson ones. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty I know sure he did the Manson. I, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that he, uh, whoever he fucking associates with, they had some of the ashes from Manson. Oh, interesting. And they oh, worked I, them into a batch of the. I Manson believe masks. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, that's pretty crazy. I didn't Weird know that. shit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But no, he does a lot. I mean, he fucking works with bands like Macabre and stuff. And right, currently working War. on big projects with them. Yeah, He's Gwar. done all kinds of cool. He's shit. He's doing that fucking the Ed Gein fucking. You know, the barnyard trophy, I guess you would call oh, it. Oh, yeah. Like, that thing looks so awesome. It looks amazing. Yeah, he's got that big show coming up with yep. uh, Macabre, Macabre that he's doing that for. It's awesome that he does all that work with Macabre, too. Yeah, right? really cool. So, Sick Rick, when I say that, it's S-I-K-R-I-K, masks.com. I'll link to it in the episode description. But seriously, guys, the quality of these masks is absolutely unfucking believable uh, They come, if you want to order them, with a stand, like... You'll see in the pictures here in the studio, ours are on stands. Uh, We got this new table-mounted stand that we're going to start to use. So when we feature a mask each week, we'll have it on the stand and talk about it. Fuck yeah. uh, So, yeah. So uh, to be talking about Sick Rick a little bit more than you're used to hearing. Thank you to everybody. Holy shit, guys. We were our number two most listens in one week. However it happened last week, 5,930 <laughs> listens. That's amazing. Fuck so, yeah, dude. Thank you. That's like th- almost three times or two and a half times our normal like the, what listeners. We normally so did, that's yeah. great. That's really great. It's our second highest week, right? It is. It is. So we appreciate that very much. <laughs> How high are you right now? And so uh, we hope you guys dig this bonus episode. Now, Chris, you know I grew up on the East Coast, so I'm familiar with Megaforce Records. They were based in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Um, they released the debut Metallica album. I mean, the one. Kill them all, baby. Everybody kill knows them that fucking shit. all. I mean, holy shit. 
that is absolutely huge. I mean, such an influence on metal from that point forward. I mean, I don't know what it was about Metallica themselves, but that album, like, like you said, just like catapulted like thrash metal, like yeah, to everyone. And that album came out like I, I, that was like what eighty three early yeah eighty eighty three ish yeah, yeah I so, so I was eighty three I would have been like fucking five or six <laughs> right but still yeah. like even before was, your time but I mean just as a metalhead you right, know yeah, like when I, when I as I got started. older in like uh, my early teens and I first heard it, I was like holy shit this is like fucking fast as oh, fuck yeah. dude like well you so, know I I first heard Ride the Lightning. And I was like, wow, what the fuck is that? Like, they're playing so fast. Like, the song Fight Fire with Fire. Right. I'm like, holy shit, from listening to Maiden and Judas Priest, right, right, that's a pretty big difference. And then I went and saw them on that tour. Blew me the fuck away. And before that, though, I went and got Kill Em All because I saw that was the first that one. Was, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, what the hell is so that? So those two albums and then followed up with Master of Fucking Puppets. I mean, wow. So That, that to me is the best Metallica album. It, fucking Puppets. It would me, definitely. That is definitely yeah. my favorite. I happen to favor Ride the Lightning only because that was, the for me, the first one. Right. And that first time I saw them on their tour, just absolutely amazing. But just his his influence on metal just from metallica alone yeah. is huge and then you add all these other bands i, I mean, mean you're the guy that found metallica and signed them and put them out right you're, holy shit dude. yeah and like, they're from california he's right. out in new jersey yeah. so very unlikely come you know the way they they stumbled on him which i'll talk about now joey as metalheads i mean we could definitely appreciate the what he did and I'm sure in your early years, you know, you would have been influenced by these bands. I know Anthrax is a band you really dig. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the East Coast, too, in Connecticut as well. So I guess I was just lucky in that sense because even back in the 80s and the late 80s, I was already getting into, like, I was into Exodus and Testament and all that shit. Right. So even me being, like, 10 years old or 9 or whatever, like, I already had good influences. Uh but, you know, that's to be expected when all that music was coming out of that area. Right. But um, I've even brought in a couple uh, tapes of mine with me right now, a couple Mega Force tapes. Oh, nice. I uh, brought uh, Testament Practice What You Preach, M.O.D., Gross Misconduct, and The Anthrax Among the Living because... Fucking A, dude. It was... I mean, back then, like, you grow up and you start, you know, you notice bands by their band name and you notice bands by their album cover uh, or, or, and like yeah. yeah and you would buy it for like there were other reasons that determined if you would pick this tape over this tape back in the day if you didn't know anything about either one right um one of the things that's really big is if you turn that motherfucker over and you see john and marcia's azula on the back of there right that's a good chance that you're gonna like you're what gonna you're get fucking something seeing, that you're you looking know? for yeah yeah but uh yeah i mean Mega Force Records is fucking huge as fuck. Could have fucking been almost as big just by signing the Metallica Kill 'em All, but went on to just fucking have a hand in so much. Yeah, I mean, just a huge influence. Again, you know, I'm older than you guys, of course, and you know, I remember you know going to the mom and pop record store and buying these Mega Force albums and just being blown the fuck away. Fuck yeah, uh, Metal Blade too. I mean, they weren't the only ones, but. You know, we're here talking about Johnny Z tonight, but, uh, you know, we could easily do one on Metal Blade. I mean, my God. So, John Zazula is born 1952 in the Bronx, which is funny uh, because in his book, he mentions his address. Um, and I text my dad and I said, hey, dad, how close was this address to where we lived? And uh, I would have been there about 15 years later than he was there because uh, I was born in 67, but he grew up uh, only a few blocks from where I lived on Fish Avenue. He lived in uh, the East Chester housing projects uh, with a mom that worked hard, uh, you know, long days as a social worker, probably not making a whole lot of money, and his dad was very abusive. Uh, he did have two younger brothers, and he tells some rough stories in the book. Um, I guess I don't really want to get into the negative stuff, right, but right, he had a right. tough life. Um, and the book is called, he refers to it as his memoir, uh, called heavy tales, which is just really great. Um, I can't recommend it enough. Just such a cool trip down memory lane. And even if you're a younger listener of metal, like you guys, 
I think you could still appreciate it and love seeing the pictures of, you know, Metallica getting fucked up at John's house because that's where all the bands used to play. Right, in the they basement. just come to the house and fucking jam. I mean, yeah, that's I mean, where you got Slayer starts. and Metallica playing in your fucking basement. Man, how crazy is that? Ridiculous. You know, to think of how big those bands got. You know? Right. So, uh, so I mean, it wasn't just Megaforce bands that were stopping by there and playing like Slayer. You know, just cool. Um, but uh, John winds up leaving home at 16. He has definitely a rough life on the streets, sleeping on park benches in New York. But while he's doing this, he meets a preacher, which is a homeless man that they nicknamed Rev. And he gave him a card one night uh, when he was sleeping on a park bench. And on one side it said Rev. And on the other side it said nothing to do but do it. And for whatever reason, he I found that very inspirational. Sparked something, yeah. Put that in his wallet, and he said from that point on, he just was driven to do what he wanted to do and to be incredibly successful doing it. He's a very spiritual dude, so I know you know some of our listeners might be turned off by that. He doesn't overdo it in the book, but he does mention it. So I'm just letting you know that that is brought up, but... I'm not a, it's not like a he's religious. Dwelling on it and no, he doesn't. He brings it up a few times though, because he feels like there was some sort of <laughs> almost divine intervention that right. brought him to that park bench to meet that dude right. that night. You know that type of thing. Now, Chris, it's always amazing to hear a story like this. A guy comes from a poor family in the projects and becomes the head of this multi-million-dollar fucking, fucking empire. Yeah, he's fucking pretty cool. It's awesome to hear that shit, man, because, like, a lot of these serial killers and murderers and whatnot, they talk right. about, like, had their childhood being brought up, like, in the same story. But this dude's out here fucking, like, oh, I'm going to do something positive. Right. And, like, I'm going to bring this, like, music to the masses. That, right. Because, I like, why would you not? So, like, it's more mental issues with fucking people out there killing or whatever about their fucking childhood. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it doesn't help, but still you can fucking get out of that. And be right. Like, we talk I... about that. Like we talk these stories about these, like you brought up Chris, these serial killers that have these horrible childhoods that turn out to be fucking serial killers. But then what about their brothers and sisters? Right. Who had the, the same, same fucking, fucking childhood. House, you know? They're out here fucking making moves and fucking living life. Honestly right. And fucking normal fucking people. Right. So, I mean, it, I, it's certainly an, a, a factor, but it can be overcome. And, and this story would definitely be one of those. Um, now, he talks about when he was six years old, he bought his first record, which was Chubby Checker. Oh, so, fuck yeah. I grew up loving that music. Um, but like most people, his musical tastes changed. As he got older, at 15, he's now listening to The Grateful Dead. Of course. Smoking probably stupid amounts of dope and dropping acid and everything else. Sounds but it was the late that. 60s, and he was <laughs> getting into that hippie movement. And you know he was out in the East Coast, but still, it was all over the place. Uh, he was married young, but it didn't last. Um, they think, believe they had a daughter. Uh, he would then meet the love of his life, though, Marsha, who ended up, uh, marrying him in 1979 uh, together they would endure some incredible adversity i mean holy shit you're talking about like spending your last dollars on some <laughs> rare albums to sell at the flea market yeah, that weekend because like, you know somebody's gonna buy them and you're gonna get that turnover but you don't have money to fucking eat right like, that's fucking like putting it all fucking out there so i mean this guy came up from literally nothing you know, it's just, it impresses me. It no, really it's does. It's fucking Unbelievable. goddamn awesome. Yeah. And he actually went to college. He worked on Wall Street for a while and said, fuck this. I don't like this. I want to do something in music. And that's what I was born to do. And here I got this card from the Rev in my wallet that says I need to just fucking do it. Oh, yeah. So Joey, John, and Marsha would start selling record albums at that flea market in New Jersey before they opened the store, Rock and Roll Heaven. Yeah, Rock and Roll Heaven was their <clears throat> own physical store that was literally <laughs> a fucking hard rock and early yeah. metal fucking, you know, place. And it's cool because 
you know, you see it like that where uh, where some people that were just into the scene that got a passion for the thing are able to, you know, that's the way that they can fucking support and do what they want to do. <clears throat> and you saw it with, like, fucking, you know, uh, with Mayhem, and they opened up fucking their record store over there in Norway. Right. And, and it's like, how fucking influential is that? Because you've got all the people that everybody's checking out there hanging out fucking right. bringing you like if they're doing new music they're, they're bringing, bringing it in yeah and yeah. you know like john and marshall like they probably heard so much music there's, that no one else ever even that, heard yeah that's never been released or anything yeah there's tons of pictures in this book of people at the store like yeah. james hetfield yeah. king diamond venom i mean all these fucking bands i mean like you said they're on tour they yeah. stop by people you know in store they're signing shit so turning people onto them, it's just it's just such a cool thing, and it's wild because a lot of them like record stores are kind of they're not really a thing of the past because luckily the hipsters kind of brought it back a little. They bit. They did, but it's a it's a high it's more of a costly fucking venture now. It is, but uh, you know record stores like we said those guys being able to open them like that was so fucking cool. Um, Growing up, those are the places that I would go to that and pawn shops right. to find the music that I was looking for. Always pawn shops, yeah. Now. And yeah. it was like amazing finding shit that you didn't even know about. Oh, like, yeah. oh man, what's this? Right. Sometimes you got burnt. Sometimes you got something home and you listen. Oh, like, man, me it's and CK garbage. used to joke about right. that. I like, mean, oh, this looks so badass and it's horrible. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. like you could pre-listen to it. Right, every right. Fucking album. Yeah, yeah like, there was no fucking YouTube I, or like, you know. I know, it, like uh, later days, Sam Goody, they had like the pre-listen kiosk. But it was yeah, only like yeah. what was pop and what was on the radio that right. you could check out. It wasn't anything that not going to be. The I was trying to album. find yeah. the last big one that like I really love to go to. I mean, I'll still go to any like other record stores when I go places. But the last one where I used to like make trips to go there was Metal Haven in Chicago, and that place was so fucking cool because it was just a whole place of extreme metal shit. Right, that's awesome. And uh, you know. I understand why they fucking ended up, you know, going under. And I think they did online for a while after that, but probably just mostly saw off their stock and shit. But it, it's harder to fucking maintain something like that in this day and age. Right. When but everything's I, online. yeah. Right. right. But I will give a shout out to fucking Roger Boyer, to fucking mortician who fucking moved out to, uh, you know, Vegas. This motherfucker signed a contract on a fucking building literally like the day or two days before everything shut down for COVID. Oh my God. So he fucking bought this building, had to fucking sit on it for like over a year. I remember you talking. And about now this. he's, he's got it filled up and he fucking, he's got, you can go to Vegas and you go to primitive recordings, fucking record shop. And it's fucking Roger from Mortician. It's his shop. And he sells like fucking, you know, he does like other shit, like the pop figures and some of that stuff, uh, right. collectibles. But his, mostly it's fucking, you know, flags, CDs, records, awesome. fucking all metal and extreme metal shit. That's uh, cool. Our homie Zev went out there fucking yeah. uh, to visit. He's got family in Vegas, but he went out to the fucking store and shit. And he sent me pictures or some of the Gormonger CDs were in the fucking district. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's really cool. I definitely would love to see something like that. Oh, I mean, those were, you know, the way it was done back then. But as time gone on, like you said, Chris, with online and streaming, I mean, it's just, it's hard to compete. You know, it really is. Um, and, you know, today it's hard to imagine what it was like back then before the Internet and how, you know, how did we find out about bands back then? Dang. Tape trading, right? reading yeah. magazines, some somebody of them were months like, old. Yeah, somebody, your, one of your friends fucking, like, I don't know why I grabbed this, but I did. But fucking check this shit out, dude. Right. This is like dope as fuck. Oh like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just hard to imagine it back then, you know. But you know, stores like you know Rock and Roll Heaven and and the one you mentioned, Joey, and the one I used to go to, Record Broker, there in Danbury, yeah. Connecticut, uh, no more. But the guy that uh, worked there became his own store, Jerosa Records. That's the one that bought the CK collection yeah. in Brookfield, Connecticut. So. In a way, they're still around, but those stores are, are rare, and you don't see them like, like you used to. But, um, you know, I know CK loved that place, and, you know, like I said, this would have been a great, great episode for CK to do, I'm sure. I know another big one that I've been to, but I don't think it's what it was now um, as far as the metal 
section that they've got, but yeah. uh, Amoeba Records in Los Angeles. Like, oh, that okay. place is fucking huge. And, like, huh. obviously fucking metal mecca out on the West Coast. Oh, yeah. And they fucking had about everything out there. But, like I said, I've heard that it's downsized a lot of sections like that. But Yeah, that's too bad. Now, John and Marshall were putting shows together and really pulling in some big crowds. They were bringing in bands like Accept, Venom, Raven, Exciter into the U.S. to play with the bands they were finding, like Metallica and Anthrax. And um, the Anthrax story, is, or the Metallica story, is interesting because John got a hold of, and I used to have this, I think I still do somewhere, the No Life to Leather demo, which was a cassette, um that metallica had um it was a practice jam session of them with dave mustaine playing guitar and singing oh really yeah um there was like maybe 12 songs on there a mix of ride the lightning and kill them all with mustaine singing no shit yeah maybe it wasn't maybe it would have been all the old stuff it was definitely the old let's let me go back. It was all the kill them all era stuff, but Mustaine is singing. Okay. But I remember fight fire was on fight fire with fires on there. So there was some ride the lightning shit. Um, but anyway, the other side was live and it was when Kirk Hammett joined the band. Right. Um, and the live stuff is all Kirk Hammett. Um, but that was very popular in the tape trading days. Cause you know, it was so good. The quality was really good. Right. Right. Uh, for a jam tape like that. And he got a hold of that, and that's where he fucking heard him. And then in the book, he's got a picture of the phone, uh, the pay phones outside of this convenience store he used to go to where he first called Lars and talked to him on the phone yeah. about coming out to Jersey on this pay phone. There. <laughs> no fucking Picture shit. of it in the book, yeah. So it's just really cool. I mean, this guy literally you know, got a hold of these guys Brought him out to Jersey. They did shows, and then he got him to record uh, "Kill 'Em All." So, uh, but really good, you know, stories in there about people getting fucking hammered, partying. I mean, definitely a fun time to be had. I'm sure talking about how fucking Metallica would like drink like an amazing. I can only do fucking in your I fucking mean, early twenties. You're traveling the country, just jamming music, fucking getting like people like bringing you out here fucking all the time and like you say alcoholica alcoholica right? yeah, exactly for sure exactly so chris some of the stories in the book sound definitely like this could have been like the nation Shit. or at the nation you know partying I mean, I, like crazy like I said i could only imagine dude i know like what i would have been like about like all of a sudden now you're playing fucking big ass national nothing shows else all to over do but nothing that. else to do but play music and get drunk holy shit <laughs> holy shit so yeah i definitely think uh, these guys would have been worthy to come hang out at the nation back in the day for sure back in the day but fuck lars <laughs> yeah i don't like lars very much either so um john put together the very first metallica tour with raven in the united states some really cool stories about this RV that he rented him, and they trashed this fucking <laughs> RV, and it was out in California, and the guy they rented it from was, like, really worried about what they were doing to his to RV. His fucking... And I guess they sent him some pictures, and it was all tore up. It was really bad. He had to get a... <laughs> they had to get another one because it was broke down. It was bad. So uh, lots of stories like that in, in the book about that first tour. So he starts Megaforce Records. He's got a handful of people that start working for him, and they become an absolutely huge indie label, and they were getting major lab label distro. He had a lot of contacts in the industry, and like I said, that's how he got Metallica catapulted to where they went to. Right. Anthrax, they signed a major label deal. So he was really helping these bands out. Um, and even Eddie Trunk, uh, everybody knows that name in metal for his radio show oh, yeah. and for that metal show. Um, but Eddie started working for him in 1987. And so, uh, you know, he definitely catapulted a lot of people into long lasting careers, whether it be a musician or in Eddie Trunk's case, a, a DJ. Now, I know uh, what it was like back in those days, sending out the promo kits by mail, which was... Crazy. I used to work in a mailroom. Yeah. 
was the perfect job for being in a band at that time. Right. Because I was mailing out packages, envelopes for this huge multi-store company. I won't say who it was. They don't exist anymore. And I had to run this postage machine, you know. So they're running thousands of dollars of postage a day on this machine. So there's no way they're going to miss like five or six bucks, you know, mailing some shit <laughs> right, out. You just drop some shit through. So fucking... I was fucking constantly fucking <laughs> postmarking shit with postage from the, from the mail room there. And what we would do, one of our tricks, if we were trying to get somebody to review us that wasn't reviewing it, I would keep sending them one until they would review it. (laughs) As a matter of fact, the dude that uh, Ron Quintana, which is a big name in the old days of metal, Ron Quintana was supposedly the guy that Lars ripped off of the name Metallica. Oh, no shit. Because he was going to call a magazine he was starting Metallica. Yeah. And Lars got the idea and then used it. That's what the story is. Anyway... Ron Quintana was doing reviews, but it was really hard to get him to do a review of your band because everybody was right. sending everybody him shit. Everybody wants him to do it. So I sent him like probably 13 packages. I was overnighting them, so he had to like sign for it. Like I was doing everything I could to get him to fucking open this thing up. And I remember when he finally did the review, he's like, I don't think I've ever had a band this persistent in my entire life. <laughs> they sent me this over and over again until I finally review it. But it was kick-ass. That's he dug fucking it. great. Yeah. So, yeah, Ron Quintana. So, you know, those kinds of days I remember sending out the packets and, and what that was like. Now, I never got to meet John or Marsha. never went to the store. I didn't even know it existed until you know, much later, because again, without the internet, right, if you're not from that shit. area, you probably wouldn't really know about it. Um, so, you know, there were guys on the label that weren't on the label that he was booking shows with. I mentioned Venom, Slayer, Exodus, Guns N' Roses. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Now, Joey, I know you mail out stuff and can definitely relate to A what lot. it's like oh, yeah. to have to do that. But, uh, how much has it changed now with social media and the internet? Oh, yeah, it's way different now. I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons why it's different. A big part of that's the cost. Everything's so much more expensive now. Right. Um, whenever COVID <laughs> happened, that added other things because as far as getting stuff internationally, all of a sudden you're waiting like fucking forever. But, you know, I've been doing my label since 2006, so for a while, and consistently sending stuff out weekly. And... Uh, you know, now it's cool because now I follow up with everybody. I'm like, hey, did you get that package? Did you get that package? Plus, right. you have tracking and all this shit. Back in the day, that wasn't the case. And right. the fact was, you didn't point. you didn't talk to this dude over the email. You probably fucking found out about it from a slip of paper that was put in another tape you bought or something. And so you just you're like, hey, I want address. to buy this. So you fucking send the, whatever this address right. and is. And hope money. you get it. Yeah, you hope you get the, it. Yeah, right. Usually exactly. you did. Yeah, it was, it was pretty fucking, you know, it was pretty honest to be, to, to be for real and right you know with the you know a big part of the fucking thing that helped back then was zines i like uh giving credit where that's due for like anybody that did zines i know you did one pete oh yeah those were awesome because people would get those and get them slipped into all kinds of shit so it's like pre-internet and you didn't have to buy fucking metal maniacs or whatever and you right. could find out about a little more underground shit oh yeah man zines were the fucking shit but they oh, would yeah. also send out like little fucking slips with like promos for bands and right shit, which you yeah, know people little, like, still do looking, yeah but back then it just seemed a lot more personable but yeah you would send the shit out and like you're like yeah man if you know these kids i'll send them a fucking package and they'll, in like three days they're like man did you send that out yet you know <laughs> what's up with that and it's like jesus christ like yeah i'm not fucking yeah. amazon here, and dude. uh but back in the day like i i can't even explain to these people now like man I'd, put, I'd send out fucking five bucks for a tape or something, which to me was like you a know, lot of money. A couple bucks. Time, yeah. Oh, yeah. And man, yeah. if I got it in six months, I was stoked. Oh, yeah. Like, exactly. holy fuck, look at right. this shit. Shit you know? came in well, already. Back in fuck. the day, the standard was six to eight weeks for delivery. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now it's two, three days, boom, you know, yeah. sometimes faster. It's really unbelievable. So, yeah, mail orders changed a lot. It's cool that it's still happening. Digital's cool for a fucking shitload of reasons. Like, oh, yeah. I get that, but. Right. There's something personable about that, physical, yeah, that about you know physical shit about the mail order tape trade and about record stores 
that is just going to be lost forever. Yeah. yeah, you know whatever. Yeah, I'm really glad I grew up in the era I yeah. did because I got to experience that. Now, there's many ups and downs in the story of John and Marsha Zazula. Uh, John admits he made mistakes. We all have, of course. Um, and the fact he did what he did is just absolutely amazing to me. To rise up from literally nothing, take tons of chances, to spread the word about metal, to me is just fucking awesome. Of course, a label like Megaforce would only be a stepping stone for some of these bands, like Metallica and Anthrax, who went on to these major label deals. But Megaforce still does exist. I'm honestly not sure how much of a player they are today, but there are bands. The The label is actively operating. I went online and was checking it out, and so there is a website. So I would say check them out and see what they offer. I'm sure there's some good stuff out there. Uh, John and Marsha, of course, are retired uh, they're both gone now, but they retired years ago. So there's different people that run it. Um, and they were both inducted into the Hall of Heavy Metal History in Garden Grove, California. But we that took was a... this trip to Garden Grove. <laughs> 2019 was when they were inducted. I didn't even know there was such a thing. So fuck the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. We've got Hall the Hall of Heavy, of heavy Metal History. Metal history. Yeah. So that's cooler. That sounds cooler anyway. Uh, Marsha unfortunately passed in January of 2021 and then John 13 months later, February of 2022. So just not the no, not, five months ago. Yeah. Um, and that's what gave me the idea to want to do this. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it would have been really cool to be able to talk to him. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's what made me want to check it out by the book. The interviews, there's lots of them on YouTube you can listen to or watch. Uh, really cool to hear him talking about back in the day, what it was like. Oh, um, yeah. It is a very inspiring story. Um, I can't say enough about his book, Heavy Tales, which is awesome. Um, and you can As learn a lot more. by John Zazula. Yeah. Just so many great stories in there. I mean, we could have done a full two-hour podcast on this. Oh, yeah. But we're doing this as a bonus. And so giving you a taste. Uh, guys, anything you want to add to this one? Uh, I was just going to read off a couple of lyrics real fast. Yeah. As we were talking about John Zilla, like, you know, Anthrax was fucking at his fucking heels. Like, man, sign us. So with Anthrax came S.O.D. as well. Right. right. Speak English to Die album. And then breaking off of that, of course, came M.O.D. M-O-D yeah. Right. Um. But in uh, M.O.D.'s Gross Misconduct album, you know, put out by Megaforce because they put out all their shit, but uh, they got a song called Theme Song, and some of the lyrics in it are pretty classic. And John and Marsha Zula both, like, did fucking uh, some of the vocals on it with them. Oh, cool. So if anybody listens, go check out M.O.D. Theme Song. I'll but to check that out. They said, uh, uh, we are M.O.D. and we're on Megaforce. Not just a record label, a guiding light. We're never lost. John and Marsha manage Jeff and Leslie book our shows. We write the songs and play the town and make friends on the road. And like the whole time, them and the Zulas are just screaming. Dude, that's that fucking shit. dope. Yeah. That's fucking cool, man. That's awesome. I did not realize that. I'll, that's fucking I'll dope. Yeah. That. yeah, that's cool. So yeah, they were just a huge influence in so many ways. So just the both of them, really, we could have done this on both John and Marsha. Oh yeah. But because uh, really it's, the it's names like are interchangeable. Washington. What's that? It's like George Washington, man. Behind every great man, there's, <laughs> there's a great, great woman. woman. <laughs> that woman was Marsha Zazula. <laughs> All right. Well, we hope you guys like this one tonight. And, uh, of course, our Murder Metal Mayhem intro music is by Low 12. And uh, we appreciate you guys listening. Um, you know, Chris, tell the friends, you know, spread the word. Yeah, if I can go check that shit out, like. You know you was out there drinking, hanging out yesterday on the 4th. Right. You could have been just like, hey, y'all. Yeah, you got to check, check this out. Check this out. Like, So, yeah, just let your friends know when you're hanging out. If you haven't already, do it again. That's right. And Joey, we talked about our new sponsor, Sick Rick. Sick yes. Rick Masks. Man, out of Ohio fucking does some of the dopest fucking masks. Uh, yeah. And he's... He's professional, but he's also one of the most down to earth dudes. Yeah, you could buy him wearable yeah. or display. Yep. Ours are all display, um, but if you buy him wearable, he'll cut the eyes out. Uh, some of the masks are hard to wear like that, like <laughs> the Gacy, the, eyes, yeah. um, the way the eyes line up because right. of the hat. 
um, the pogo mask, but uh, the new one, Jim Jones, absolutely unfucking believable. He'll do like variations of each one, yeah, He'll do, like zombie style or black, and, black white. and white. Or, yeah, because yeah. we've got some Patina. like that. Our Gein mask is yeah. a zombie, yeah. and the the fish one was black and white right. with and the blue Holmes, eyes. Holmes is patina. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Very very cool uh, things. So link to that in the episode description. S I K R I K masks dot com. Also, Rick said go to his Facebook page, Rick Fisher, and friend request them because that's how he keeps people up on his uh, masks. Hell so yeah. I'll link to that as well, Rick Definitely, Fisher's yeah. Facebook page, because he's got a, a private page that he uses for that. Uh, check out murdermetalmayhem dot com. Listen to all those past episodes and like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to that YouTube channel. We're going to be doing more YouTube stuff. We are definitely stuff. going to be having a lot more YouTube stuff. We are. Out. So you definitely don't want to miss it. Just wait. You don't want to miss that. Um, and you anywhere you listen to the show, give us a like, leave a comment, rate it, whatever you can do. Uh, even if you think we suck, I mean, I'd love to hear from you. You right. know, maybe we can win you I'll, over. I'll read your damn fucking terrible yeah, review on the yeah, podcast. And not it. even so, give a shit. We hope you like <laughs> it, but if you think we're a bunch of fucking immature jackasses, let us know. Let us know. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, because early on, Chris, we were we, we were, were said it was a little too Beavis and Butthead for yeah, this I, listener. We, we went hey, with it. Yeah, like, nothing wrong yeah, with are. Beavis and Butthead at all. <laughs> So support the show by joining that 666 Club, patreon.com slash murder metal mayhem. Join it for only three bucks a month. Some cool perks with that. It helps us pay the bills. So we appreciate it. And until next time, keep one foot in the gutter. Keep them horns way up in the air for Johnny Z. Fuck yeah. Mother, mother, man.